Hi guys, lots of you requested it. So this is my all-in-one new spec biology AQA video and it's long. I'm not sure how long it is yet, but it is very, very long. So I'm gonna whistle through the whole spec. Um, yeah, and hopefully you'll find it really, really helpful. As always, I add like perfect answers all the way through this video. Don't forget my revision guides. I sell these online. They are my perfect answer revision guides. I have spent hundreds if not thousands of hours compiling these with their perfect questions, perfect answers. And go check out my website, www.sciencewithhazel.co.uk where you can see previews and buy them. Anyhow, let's get going. The nervous system is the way in which we pick up the changes in our surroundings and the nervous system brings about our response. So, in order to understand what's going on, first of all we need to understand a few key words. So there are special cells which transmit the information, and we call those information nerve impulses, and the cells are called neurons. If we have lots and lots of these neurons together, then we have nerves. So, to begin with, I'm just going to talk you through the sense organs, because these are the things which pick up the change in our environment. So crucially we have our eyes, which are sensitive to light, we have our ears, which are sensitive to sound and balance, and that's what keeps us upright. Our nose and tongue are sensitive to chemicals that we can smell and taste in our food. And our skin is sensitive to many things, including pressure, temperature and pain, and that's what keeps us safe. So we register that something's painful, so we withdraw our hand or whatever it is away from the thing which is causing pain. So it is really important that our nervous system is working really well. So, I'm going to start by talking through the pathway involved in a response. We first of all start with our stimulus, and that's really the thing that's causing us to know that something has changed in our environment. So the stimulus could be seeing something, it could be touching something hot, it could be pressure, anything really. So in this situation, I'm going to say that I've, I don't know, that I've touched a warm cup of tea. Not really hot, just warm. So the stimulus is the heat from the tea. Then the next step is the receptor, and these are the receptors in my skin, in my hand, which tell me that actually, yeah, I felt something, it's temperature, it's warm. So the receptor receives that information about the warmth, and it sends it along the first neuron. And because this neuron is involved in the sensing of the stimulus, we call it the sensory neuron. That travels along, and it reaches the CNS, the central nervous system, and this bit's key in sorting out our response. So the central nervous system consists of the spinal cord and the brain, and the brain's going to decide what it wants to do about it. So in this case, I'm going to decide that I want to pick up my tea. Then the information, the impulse, passes from the central nervous system down the motor neuron, which is a second type of neuron, and it passes along to the effector. Now the effector is ordinarily a muscle or a gland. So if the effector is a muscle, it will respond by contracting. So in this case, I will literally contract my muscles to pick up my tea. Or if it's a gland, then it will respond by secreting a substance or a hormone. Right, so we have gone from our motor neuron to our effector, and then that has literally brought about our response. So if we're talking about the steps involved in this whole process, we can start with our stimulus, then list our receptor, the sensory neuron, the central nervous system, the motor neuron, and the effector, and then the response. Now there's a second type of response you need to know about, and that's the reflex arc, the, the reflex response, and this is an involuntary thing. It's really important that we maintain our blood sugar levels within a safe range. After we've eaten, what happens is we need to lower our blood sugar levels. So insulin will be released from the pancreas, now what insulin does is it causes glucose to be converted into a storage compound which we call glycogen. That glycogen is stored in the liver, thereby removing the excess glucose from our blood. However, if we haven't eaten for a while or we've done a lot of exercise, we'll find that our blood sugar levels will decrease rapidly, so we need to up them. So in this circumstance, the pancreas releases a second hormone, this time called glucagon, not to be confused with the storage compound glycogen, and that glucagon causes the glycogen in the liver to be converted back into glucose, thereby increasing our blood sugar levels. The female reproductive system, you have two ovaries, and then it joins to the fallopian tubes, which link with the uterus, and then that links at the bottom to the vagina via kind of like a trapdoor called a cervix. The cervix is usually closed, and then obviously it opens when you have a baby. You need to know about the menstrual cycle. Being a cycle, it means it starts and finishes, and it happens every single month. Um, for around 28 days is 
an average length of cycle, but that can obviously vary from woman to woman. Right, so we're going to start by naming some hormones because that's always a good place to start. And I'm going to start with FSH. So FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. Now these follicles are basically the eggs inside the ovaries and it's kind of like before they're fully mature. And so by definition, follicle storm stimulating hormone kind of means it's the hormone which causes the follicles, the eggs, to mature. So if you're asking me to examine the role of the FSH, I would say that it causes the eggs in the ovary to mature. FSH's second job is to stimulate the ovary to produce estrogen and that's another very important hormone. But first of all, I'm going to talk about luteinizing hormone. LH. Now luteinizing hormone is a very important hormone because what its role is is to cause ovulation and ovulation is the exact point at which the egg is released from the ovary. So if they ask you what ovulation is, you say the release of an egg from the ovary, what is the role of LH to cause ovulation? So at that point the egg pops out and it will travel down the fallopian tube. Next up we need to talk about oestrogen. As I said before, oestrogen is produced by the ovary. Now oestrogen is really important because it causes the uterus lining to build up and it's important that that uterus lining becomes very thick in order to support the egg which if it gets fertilised will implant itself. Progesterone is essential because it maintains the wall of the uterus and without progesterone what would happen is the uterus lining would flake away and that would be a period. So it's really important that at all stages during pregnancy that progesterone levels remain really high. It's worth noting that oestrogen also inhibits FSH production. That's really important. Why? Because if you're building up the uterus lining in order for a zygote to implant, the last thing you want is more eggs in the ovary maturing. Now we're going to talk about the artificial control of fertility, so basically how you stop women getting pregnant. Obviously they can take the pill, which they'll have to take every day, and there's different types of pill. So a lot of them contain oestrogen and progesterone, and what they do is they lower FSH levels and thereby stop eggs maturing. Obviously if eggs can't mature then there's no way you can have a baby because there'll be no egg being ovulated. Now some progesterone only pills have less side effects than the mixed pill, but um, you do have to take those very regularly, otherwise your hormones take over and you could become pregnant quite easily. One way of stopping pregnancy is obviously abstinence, and abstinence basically means not having sex. You could also use barrier methods such as condoms or something called a diaphragm, and that just stops the sperm hitting the egg in the first place. Intrauterine devices, things like the coil which sit inside the uterus, and they make it an inhospitable environment for a fetus to grow, so you can't get pregnant that way. And lastly, and most drastically, there are surgical methods, so such as cutting the sperm ducts in the man, cutting the um, overduct in the female, and obviously if there's no tube, then the sperm or the egg can't get to where they need to be. Mitosis is the type of cell division which produces clones, so identical daughter cells, and these are needed in the growth and repair of organisms. Let's quickly compare sexual and asexual reproduction. Remember sexual reproduction needs two parents, like a male and a female, and it produces organisms which have genetic variation. So that means that your brother will be different from your sister. And the reason why this is good is because if the environment changes, it means that some organisms will be adapted to that new environment and they will survive. Whereas if everyone was the same and the environment changed, everyone would die. Asexual reproduction only requires one parent and because of this is much quicker. It's very good for when the environment conditions are favourable because it means you can generate lots of offspring very quickly. But obviously the disadvantage here is that if the environment changes, you'll find that lots of death occurs. Now, when we look at fungi, you find that they reproduce both asexually and sexually, which is quite odd. Asexual reproduction is used when the conditions are good, so there's plenty of food and oxygen available, and sexual reproduction will be used when conditions are bad. Now, fungi use spores in order to asexually reproduce. When they sexually reproduce, two hyphae, which are two structures on the fungi, will meet and then their nuclei will fuse and that's how sexual reproduction will occur in fungi. Asexual reproduction in plants occurs in plants such as strawberries and spider plants and like I said will only need one parent and will produce offsprings which are clones of the original parent plant. Sexual reproduction is all to do with like bees so they'll deposit the male gamete which in the case of a plant is the pollen on top of the stigma, which is the female part of the plant, and it will grow down the pollen tube and hit the egg. And when that 
pollen hits the egg in the female plant's ovary, that's where fertilisation occurs. So I know plants are completely different from animals, but you can kind of see how sexual reproduction is occurring here. Remember that some plants will make themselves very attractive to bees, so they'll have a nice scent, they'll be very colourful. Other plants won't use insects at all to pollinate, they'll use wind pollination. Now remember proteins are biological molecules and they're made up of long chains of amino acids which fold together to form a protein. Protein are very useful molecules, we find them obviously in enzymes, keratin, collagen, these are structural proteins. So proteins are very much part of our lives and it's, they're very important and we need to know how to build them. And it's quite a complicated process. Now in terms of controlling what proteins get made, you need to dictate the, the order of the amino acids in order to produce the correct protein and this is a very complicated process involving genes. It's important that you know the definition of a gene which is that it is a section of DNA which codes for a particular protein. Now DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid and it is the basic building blocks. DNA dictates how what our personalities are like, what we look like, our characteristics are just a very important molecule and you need to know that it is arranged in a double helix which effectively means it's like a ladder that twists on itself. Um, hence the helix. The DNA is found inside chromosomes and chromosomes are these structures that we find in the nucleus of the cell because remember the nucleus contains the genetic information. So we have our nucleus which contains chromosomes, remember it contains 23 pairs in most body cells, the exception here are our sex cells, the gametes, so the sperm and eggs. So we have our chromosomes and inside we find our DNA. Remember with genes we have the word allele, and an allele is a different form of the same gene. So to put that into context, it's something like your eye colour. The alleles for eye colour could be blue, could be green, could be grey, could be brown. Okay. However, if you look around in the everyday population, you'll find that most people out there really have brown coloured eyes. And that's because the allele for brown eye colour is dominant. Right, to introduce another tricky word, we're going to talk about the word phenotype. Now, phenotype is the physical... Um, appearance of the gene. So for example, in my case it would be brown eyes. However, I don't know if I have two of the same alleles or two different alleles and that's because brown is dominant. So what that means is that my genotype and what a genotype is, that's the genes you have inside you, so the actual genes that you contain. My alleles could be big B, little b, and I'd still have brown eyes, even though I have one allele for brown eyes and one allele for blue eyes, or it could be two big Bs. And then that would mean that I was homozygous, because what homozygous means is that you have two copies of the same allele. So that could be big B, big B, brown eyes. However, if I'm heterozygous, that would mean I'd have one copy of brown, one copy of blue, so that's big B, little b. However, I would be heterozygous, but I'd still be brown eyed because brown is dominant over blue. Sorry, that does sound quite tricky. I'm, I'm thinking that as I'm saying it. Now, where does the big B and the little B come from? We just use letters to, uh, to assign alleles, basically, so we know what we're talking about. So if you're talking about an allele, you're going to give a little letter. Now, you can pick whichever letters you want, but people tend to pick letters where there's a real differentiation, a real difference between the capitalization and the small lettering, like B. But now we're going to have a look at actually drawing Punnett squares. A homozygous blue-eyed mother and a heterozygous brown-eyed father want a baby, draw a genetic cross and find out the percentage likelihood of having a blue-eyed baby. Okay, so there's a really simple way of doing this and it's really important that you follow the same steps and then the answer will just plop out on your lap and I promise it's really easy. So first of all, write two headings, mother, can you read that, and father. Okay, I write phenotype here on the left-hand side. It helps me as well with the understanding. So what's the phenotype? Right, that's the, what the mother and father actually have in terms of eye colour. So I'm going to write blue and father brown. Right, genotype. I also, I'm going to pick the letter B because it makes sense. Both of the alleles begin with B. So the genotype for the mother. Now I know automatically that it's going to be small b, small b. And that's because blue is recessive, which means that you need two of the same alleles in order for the feature to be exhibited in the person. So, oh, I can hear the cat meowing. Can you hear the cat meowing? Anyway, but the fact that it's homozygous also tells me that the letters will be the same. So I'm going to write B, B, 
and there's the mother's genotype. Right, the father, because they're brown, I'd remember, because they're brown, they could be big B, little B, or two big Bs. However, heterozygous tells me that the annuals are different, so it's going to be big B, little B. Right, next one is going to be gametes. Right, a gamete is a sex cell, so that's going to be the egg in the mother's case and the sperm in the father's case. Now remember, due to meiosis, now that is definitely another video in needing to be made. Due to meiosis, um, the gametes can either be small b, small b, or big b, little b, and I'll show you what that looks like. These are supposed to be eats, but I've got to let the cat in. She's meowing. Right, in terms of gametes, okay, so remember in meiosis, you have to halve the genetic information in either the egg or the sperm, so that when the sperm and egg meet at fertilisation, you have a full set of genetic information, but not double, because otherwise you'd end up doubling the amount of genes and DNA you had, which would be crazy. So in the mother's case, her eggs can either be small b or b, so i.e. that they've all got to be small b. However, in the father's case, the sperm can either be a big B or a little B, and it depends due to meiosis, which allele was fed into that sperm. Which means, when we're drawing our genetic cross, I'm going to draw that now. I'm going to write father here. Oh, I've spelled it wrong. No. Mother here. Is that still on camera? Just about. Here's our planet square, our genetic cross, and then you just have to cross them. So this one is this, this is this. Um, as you can see, these are the same, so I didn't actually need to draw the second line in the planet square, but I wanted to keep it nice and straightforward. So if we look, we can see that this person will be brown-eyed. It's good to write it so you know what's going on. This person will be blue. This child will be brown again, and this one will be blue. So, the point is that when these, this mother and father have a baby, 50%, because half of them, will be blue-eyed, and that's a probability, and 50% will be brown-eyed. So now I've answered the question, because it was, what is the percentage likelihood of having a blue-eyed baby? And the answer is 50%. Um, you can write it as a ratio, which is one to one, or you can say half of them will have um, blue eyes. So I hope that was, let me just zoom out so you can see that. So yes, 50% will be blue-eyed, 50% will be brown-eyed, and that's a one-to-one -one ratio. Now we're going to talk about selective breeding. Selective breeding is all about humans breeding plants and animals with desired characteristics. Such characteristics could include a high crop yield if you're talking about a vegetable, could include lots of milk if you're talking about a dairy cow, if you're talking about a beef cow, it could be calves that have a massive amount of muscle so that there's plenty of food to be got off them. It could even be domestic dogs being bred with certain characteristics such as a docile nature if they're in your house, because obviously you don't want an aggressive dog in your house. Now, if you were going to selectively breed a cow that had a lot of muscle on it, you'd obviously pick a bull that had a lot of muscle, you'd pick a female cow that had a lot of muscle, you'd interbreed them, you'd expect their child, their baby cow, their calf, there's the word, um, to have very similar characteristics. So yeah, it's all about picking parent plants, parent animals with the sort of characteristics that you're after. So what is genetic engineering? Well, it's when you alter the genes of an organism. Um, and why do we want to do that? Well, it's so that we can produce huge amounts of a required substance. So the example we always look at is insulin, and remember that insulin is a hormone, it's released from the pancreas, and what it does is it lowers blood sugar levels. For people who can't produce insulin, they have type 1 diabetes, and they can get really ill indeed, so it's really important that they can inject insulin into their bodies. Let's now look at the detail involved in genetic engineering. So what we do, we tend to do the exactly the same steps. We get a bacterium, remember that a bacteria doesn't have a distinct nucleus, but it has little loops of ge genetic information, which we call plasmids. Now what you do here is you remove that plasmid and you chop it open using an enzyme. And then what you're going to do is grab the gene from a human that is successfully producing insulin and you're going to insert that gene into the now cut open plasmid and you're going to use another enzyme to actually stick those together. 
Then at that point you have what's called a recombinant plasmid, which is one which has been changed, and you can put it back into a bacteria and pop it into a fermenter. And then with ideal conditions, so correct temperatures, pHs, oxygen levels, etc., before long you'll have a huge supply of insulin. So first of all, remember that a clone is a genetically identical individual that has been produced asexually from one parent. The first way in which we clone animals is using embryo cloning. So in this situation you get, for example, your prize bull, your prize cow, you mate them and then obviously the sperm from the bull will fertilise the egg from the cow and it will develop into first a zygote and then an embryo. Then what the farmer does is that he washes out the uterus of the cow to remove the embryo from the cow. And at this point the embryo is so early on in its life that actually all the cells are unspecialised. They're undifferentiated and what that means is that the cells can develop pretty much into anything at that point. So if you break up that early embryo into lots of different parts, you can then transplant the mini embryos into the uterus of what we call surrogate cows. So these are effectively incubating machines where the calf will grow for nine months but they won't actually be genetically related to the calf in question. Finally, adult cell cloning. This is slightly more complicated. But in this situation, what you do is you get a body cell, so like a skin cell, a muscle cell, any kind of cell, a body cell though, that has a full number of chromosomes from which an whichever animal you're trying to clone. You remove that body cell and you take the nucleus out of the body cell and that is what we call ennucleating the cell. So remove that nucleus from the cell. Then we need to get an egg cell from a surrogate or just any other cow and what we do is we remove that nucleus too and we discard it and we place the nucleus from the body cell inside the egg cell because the egg cell is going to just contain this information and we use an electric shock to cause them to fuse together. At that point we just need to implant that new egg cell into the uterus of the surrogate so that gets implanted into the uterus and then it undergoes mitosis to divide to create the embryo which will then develop into the new calf. Darwin was a scientist who was alive in the 19th century and he went off on this voyage across the world on a ship called HMS Beagle and he went to the Galapagos Islands and he found many many different species, he found lots and lots of different fossils and he looked at those and he thought hold on I don't think religion can explain everything we see here. So what he did was he then developed the theory of evolution and the theory of natural selection. Now the theory, don't get them confused, the theory of evolution states that all, all species alive today and many more millions which have become extinct over the years originated from small life forms which later evolved and became the more complex life forms we see on today's planet. Natural selection is his mechanism for describing that evolutionary change and this is now the really important bit and every single question I've seen on natural selection goes like this. So the crucial point is, is, that, the, is that there is variation within a species that means that I'm different to my family, it means that you're different to your sister, and that's obviously you're an identical twin. And what that means is that some individuals in that species are better suited to the environment compared with others. And they always like to use things like swordfish or elephants to describe this, or giraffes. So let's take the giraffe for example. So some giraffes back in time had longer necks, which meant that they were able to reach leaves higher up the tree. Now all those giraffes that didn't have the long necks died. So it meant that those with the longer necks were more likely to survive and breed successfully, thereby passing their genes on to their offspring, so therefore their offspring had longer necks too. And if you were to provide a full mark answer on that, you would literally just say there was variation within a species due to mutation. Those with the better adaption, such as having a longer neck, are more likely to survive and reproduce. And then lastly, you need to say that they pass those genes on to their offspring. Now we're looking at fossils, so let's start with the definition of fossils, where they're the remains of living organisms that died millions of years ago and they're found in rock and ice and many other places. They'd like you to know how fossils are formed. First of all, hard parts which do not decay, such as teeth and bones. These are examples of fossils. Sometimes you can say that hard parts are replaced with minerals, and that's something like an ammonite if you've ever been to Lyme Regis and gone fossil hunting, so actually the fossil looks like a stone. Sometimes conditions needed for decay are absent, and remember such conditions are things like oxygen and quite warm temperatures, so if you don't have oxygen and you don't have high temperatures, you may find that decay doesn't occur. An example of this is like a woolly mammoth preserved in a big ice cube. Lastly, fossils can appear in the form of traces 
of animals which once lived or plants that once lived, so that could be rootlet traces, it could even be animals poo, that's a type of fossil, or it could be footprints, so that's quite a niche one. Now, a fossil record is all about looking at the history of an organism over time, so we look at various samples from millions of years ago over time, and we can see, for example, how a horse has evolved. Now, they often say that the fossil record is incomplete for many organisms. Why is that? Well, many organisms were soft-bodied, so things like bacteria, and obviously they don't form fossils, so fossils haven't been formed. Sometimes conditions needed for fossilisation to occur haven't, haven't happened. So, for example, if it's too hot or there's lots of oxygen, obviously that body's going to rot away straight away. Sometimes we haven't found the fossils, so they're there, but we haven't dug in the right places. And other times fossils may have formed, but then later they may have been dragged under the Earth's mantle and been destroyed by geological activities. So that's unfortunate because although the fossils are there, they've been very much destroyed by all that molten magma. Let's talk about something a bit depressing, which is extinction. What is the definition of that? Well, it's the permanent loss of all members of a particular species. Other organisms may cause other organisms become extinct. That might sound a bit strange, but it's actually quite obvious. How could they do that? Well, first of all, they could eat them. That would be a very good way of causing another organism to become extinct if you just ate them all. Secondly, they could introduce new pathogens, new bacteria and viruses, which could wipe out a particular species very, very quickly. And lastly, they could simply outcompete them. They could eat all the animals' food, they could take all their territory, all their space for breeding. That would be another good way of wiping out another animal's existence. Remember what the definition of a species is. Remember that spe members of the same species can breed and produce fertile offspring, and that's crucial. They need to be fertile offspring, otherwise new generations will not be formed. We'll quickly touch on the dinosaur's extinction. There's lots of different theories here, no one can really know. A popular one is obviously then asteroid hit and destroyed all the dinosaurs by the fact that everything will have changed because that asteroid would have hit and caused massive earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, which would very quickly wipe out the dinosaurs. Coupled with that asteroid, think about when it hit, a huge amount of dust and matter would have ended up in the atmosphere. The thinking here is that the sun was blocked out and therefore the plants couldn't photosynthesize so they all died and without plants obviously all animals would die. A less interesting theory is that polar ice caps melted depositing an awful lot of water into the sea lowering the temperature causing mass extinction that way. Let's quickly touch on antibiotic resistant bacteria. So remember antibiotics are substances used to kill bacteria the issue is arising that we are running out of antibiotics because increasingly bacteria are becoming resistant, which means they're no longer killed by these antibiotics. That's due to things like us overusing antibiotics, not finishing our course when we're instructed to take it by the doctors. And you see what happens is the antibiotic is given to the bacteria, and if these antibiotics are given too often, what you often find is that some bacteria mutate, which means they change their DNA, and therefore they're no longer affected by the antibiotic. So all the other bacteria die and you're just left with this resistant strain which can go on and reproduce and produce a huge colony of resistant bacteria and before you know it, your antibiotic is useless. And that was the huge outcry with MRSA a few years ago. Now we're talking about classification. Classification is all to do with putting animals into groups based on their similarities. Now, Carl Linnaeus was a scientist who first talked about the modern day classification system we used, and he classified organisms based on their structures and their characteristics. You need to know the order in which he actually classifies various animals. So there's a big order that you can go right from the top and it will narrow and narrow and narrow until you get to the actual organism. And the way you need to remember this is using this mnemonic, which is king prawn curry or fat greasy sausages. Now I'll just explain that. King stands for kingdom, prawn stands for phylum, curry stands for class, or stands for order, fat stands for family, greasy stands for genus, sausages stands for species. That was painful, but I got there in the end. So if they ask you the, the ways in which animals are organised and how they're classified, you need to actually talk about those things that I said using that mnemonic. All living organisms can be divided into one of six kingdoms and I'm just going to chat through what the various kingdoms are. So you've got plants, animals, you've got fungi, protoctists, and then the prokaryotes, which we divide into the bacteria and the archaea. 
Um, before they used to be five kingdoms, but they've made it slightly more complicated. You just need to know the names of the six kingdoms. Remember that all organisms are named by the binomial system, which includes both a genus name and a species name. So when you're naming using the binomial system, remember the genus will have a capital letter, the species name will have a small letter, and we tend to italicize it. This is so much information. It's more of a common sense topic, but I do know that some of you struggle with it, so I don't want to ignore it. Right, adaptation, that is to do with organisms and them having characteristics which mean that they are better suited for a particular environment. I'm going to take it from an animal that lives in a cold environment, an animal that lives in a hot environment, and we're also going to have a look at plants. So let's just dive straight in to looking at things like polar bears and arctic foxes. Right, what you will find is, first of all, they have white fur, Y for camouflage, so they blend into the surroundings. They have something like a polar bear, I'm going to actually use that. They have large feet, Y to stop themselves sinking into the snow, because if you have larger feet, then you have a larger area to spread their weight over. It's the same reason why skis work, is because you just don't sink in as much. Right, what else do they have? They have small ears. Why? Because they need a small surface area here because they want to minimise their heat loss to the surroundings as obviously it's very cold and they want to keep warm. They'll have a thick layer of fat for insulation. They'll have thick fur for the same reason to conserve heat. If they ask you stuff like, oh, adaptations for catching prey, then you need to talk about sharp teeth for tearing into flesh, long legs so they can run fast, but they don't usually ask that. It's more of adaptations to their environment. If we take an animal in a hot country, something like a camel that lives in a desert, again they have large feet so that they don't sink into the sand. They have large ears to increase the surface area to maximise the amount of heat that they can lose because obviously they don't want to overheat under the hot desert sun. You'll find that they have long eyelashes which will prevent sand getting into their eyes. They have thin fur, thin layer of fat to minimise the amount of heat that they maintain. Right, lastly, let's look at the cactus. Now, the cactus um, obviously again lives in the hot environment. It stores water in its stem. It has spines rather than leaves, and what that does is it prevents water loss by transpiration. They have shallow, extensive roots. Um, I hope that makes sense to you. Basically, their roots spread out a very long way, metres and metres away from the actual plant, and what that means is if it rains, then what can happen is that the plant can absorb as much of that water even if it's really far from them. I'm now going to talk about a food chain. Remember, a food chain is just a way of showing what eats what. We call each stage of the food chain a trophic level, and it's just literally what I just said. A trophic level is a stage of a food chain. Food chains always start with producers, and these tend to be green plants. The reason it starts with a producer is because a producer absorbs energy from the sun. So yes, food chains begin with producers. What eats the producer? Well, it's the consumer. Because it's the first consumer, we call it the primary consumer. Next up we have the secondary consumer, which eats the primary consumer, and then we have the tertiary consumer, which eats the secondary consumer. Let's again touch on a few other keywords, herbivore, carnivore and omnivore. Remember herbivore just eats vegetation, clearly. A carnivore eats meat, and an omnivore like us and pigs, they eat both a mixture of vegetation and animal matter. You will tend to find that the last organism in the food chain, which will tend to be the tertiary consumer, we call that the top carnivore. The reason being is that very rarely does it get eaten by something else. So something like a polar bear never has to worry about being eaten because it is the top carnivore in an arctic food chain. The next thing I just wanted to touch on is if you have any predator-prey cycle questions, remember that the prey numbers will always peak before the predator numbers. Um, and that's because there's a time delay as the predator numbers can only peak when there's enough prey to feed on and then as soon as the prey numbers drop then you will see a secondary drop in the predator numbers and that's because there's less food for them to feed on. So let's talk about the water cycle. Now it's a cycle so it doesn't really have a start and an end but you just need to pick anywhere and keep going with it. I think the easiest thing is to start with evaporation. So water evaporates from the surface of our oceans, our seas, our streams and it ends up in the air. Now it cools and condenses and in this way we're forming clouds. Now we know what comes out of clear clouds, that's rain and the fancy word for rain is precipitation. So water falls out of our clouds as precipitation and ends up on the ground where there are lots of plants and trees willing to absorb that water through their roots. How does water end up back in the atmosphere? Well remember these plants transpire which means they lose water from the surface of their leaves and also all living organisms respire. So the water has entered the atmosphere again and then the continual cycle of evaporation, condensation, precipitation, transpiration, respiration continues. Just remember an odd word, percolation, which is when water runs off the ground through gaps in the rocks.
Let's start with where carbon is. And carbon, carbon is found as carbon dioxide in the air. Now, which organisms use carbon dioxide? Well, that will be green plants that photosynthesize. So your first point will be that plants take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Then your second point is that they use the carbon to make sugars. But the point is, the plants take in carbon to help them grow. So then what happens is the plants respire, as do all living organisms. And remember that the byproduct of respiration is carbon dioxide. So that's the first bit of CO2 being released back into the atmosphere. What else do plants do? Well, they die. And what causes the rotting of the plants? Well, it's microorganisms. So the microorganisms feed on those plants, and guess what? They respire, so there's more CO2 returning to the atmosphere. Next up, the plants might not die straight away. They may be, be eaten by animals, so the animals will munch on that plant. The carbon in the plant will now become part of the animal's body, and then guess what? The animals respire, so they release CO2 back into the atmosphere. At some point the animals will die and then we know what happens here, we know that the microorganisms will feed on those bodies, um, the carbon will become part of the microorganism and then the microorganism respires again releasing CO2. So as you can see the start of this cycle starts with CO2 being absorbed in photosynthesis and then basically you just need to talk through all the different ways by which CO2 is released back into the atmosphere and that's obviously going to be by respiration. So I'm going to continue by talking about human impact on the environment and we're going to start by looking at eutrophication. Remember eutrophication is the process whereby rivers become devoid of all aquatic life and that's due to fertilisers and sewage being washed into the rivers. If that's not making a lot of sense to you, I'm going to go through all the steps now. So step one, sewage or excess fertilisers are washed into rivers. These fertilisers and sewage cause the rapid growth of algae, which is like a green plant. The algae dies due to competition for light because literally there's just not enough light for all those algae trying to photosynthesize so they die. The dead algae provide food for microorganisms. The microorganisms grow in number and um, because they're respiring aerobically they use up all the oxygen in the river and then before you know it there's no oxygen for the fish so they all die and I'll probably add a summary right now so you can write it down. Next up, we need to look at acid rain. So remember, first of all, we need to look at the formation of acid rain and then the effects it has on the environment. So acid rain is caused by one of two things. First of all, the nitrogen and the oxygen in car engines react at the super high temperatures, forming nitrous oxides or nitrogen oxides, and they get released into the air. They react with water, obviously from the rain, from the clouds, and that forms um, nitric acid. And so it's a weak acid and it will fall onto the ground and it is acid rain. The second way in which we make acid rain is through sulfur impurities in fuels. So when those fuels are burnt, that sulfur reacts with the oxygen, forming sulfur dioxide. Again, that sulfur dioxide gas can react with water in the atmosphere, forming sulfuric acid, which falls, again, causing acid rain. Don't get too stressed, by the way. This acid is very weak compared with the acid you get in your chemistry lessons. The point is over time it can have quite adverse detrimental effects on the environment and now we're going to look at those. So firstly, acid rain damages trees. It also damages limestone buildings. I know that's not an effect on the environment but it's worth mentioning. Make sure you mention that they're limestone. And lastly it gets into lakes and rivers and makes it too acidic for the poor aquatic animals to survive. Now we're going to look at deforestation. Remember deforestation just means the cutting down of trees. Why do people do it? It's so that they can get land for farming, it's so that they can actually harvest those hardwoods to make furniture out of. However, it can have many, many effects on the environment and we need to look at those now. So first of all, deforestation means that those trees are cut down, which means they're no longer alive, so they can no longer photosynthesize, which means they can no longer absorb carbon dioxide. That's a bad thing because we want to remove that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so that we don't have global warming, so we don't enhance the greenhouse effect. The second problem with cutting down trees is, the thing about trees is they have a huge amount of carbon locked up in their trunks and the moment you cut them down it releases all that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So you have like a double whammy effect, so it's like doubling the amount of carbon dioxide released leading to global warming. I will discuss all the global warming issues very shortly. Um, next up, if you cut down trees, then you'll no longer have roots in the soil. So that topsoil, which before was anchored down using the roots, effectively what happens is when it rains, the topsoil gets washed away, which leaves the ground very infertile, 
and also when that topsoil washes away, it washes away also all the nutrients and again you might end up with eutrophication issues in surrounding streams and rivers. So deforestation has huge, huge knock-on effects on the environment, it's not a good thing. Let's look at methane. Remember guys that methane is released by cows farting. I know that's disgusting, but literally it is like a huge amount of methane is produced by cows farting. You might want to write it a bit more nicely in your exam, the fact that it's their digestive processes cause the release of methane gas. The second way in which humans contribute to methane is through um, farming rice because effectively the rice grows and it releases a huge amount of methane as it grows in paddy fields. So you want to talk about cow farting and the rice paddy fields as being major sources of methane. The reason why methane is such a um, terrible thing is because, again, it's a greenhouse gas. And I think, because I keep talking about greenhouse gases, global warming, I think it's about time I actually told you what happens there. So with all this carbon dioxide, methane, water vapour, these are all examples of greenhouse gases, what happens is there's a layer of gas, so the greenhouse gases, around the earth, and what happens is the sun rays come down and some of them bounce back out into space and some stay in our atmosphere. Now the ones which stay in our atmosphere heat up our planet and that's an important process because it keeps us at the right temperature. However, if you add more greenhouse gases to that layer, you're going to trap more of the sunlight energy which causes an increase in the temperature. And that is what global warming is. In terms of the effect global warming has is that the major issue is that it melts polar ice caps. That means like the massive icebergs that sit in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And if you melt a huge amount of ice, it's going to cause the sea levels to rise. And then when sea levels rise, you're going to flood low-lying land, which leads to loss of habitat for animals. It leads to um, loss of biodiversity, so that just means the variation, the huge variety of species that are, exist on our planet. There's other things which you need to mention. It causes a change in the migration patterns of birds because some birds will fly from one part of the earth to the other in winter and summer. And when global warming happens, they get confused, so they go to the wrong place. It will lead to a change in the distribution of animals, so literally where they live, because obviously those animals that live on low-lying land will no longer be able to live there. And in general, it will lead to a change in the earth's climate, so it will rain more, rain less, be hotter in winter, cooler in summer that sort of thing. So global warming has massive, massive issues. You may be asked a six mark question on this, so I'm going to write a little summary of all the effects of global warming so you can write them down for yourselves. A random thing you do need to know about is peak bog destruction. Now peat bogs are like these areas of like marshland and they're full of peat, which is like this brown muddy substance. And the thing about peat is that it's very acidic and it has very low oxygen levels provides a very unique environment and so not much can survive so plants don't break down fully. But the good thing about peat bogs is they hold an enormous amount of carbon, they're massive carbon stores. So again that's great because we don't want to enhance the greenhouse effect. However the issue is people are destroying the peat bogs because peat is a wonderful fertiliser like compost for the garden. So gardeners like to buy it to sprinkle on the ground because it will mean that their roses grow better. So with that destruction, you get a huge release of carbon dioxide, again leading to global warming and everything that I just mentioned. The issue is peat bogs take thousands of years to, to like develop, and so we can't replace them as quickly as we're destroying them. So yeah, peat bog destruction is not a good thing. So we're done. Well done for staying all this way. I'm really impressed if you managed to watch the video all in one. Don't forget about my revision guides. My perfect answer revision guides are available on my website right now at www.com sciencewithhazel.co.uk you can click on this card to buy yourself a copy of my revision guide which makes the perfect accompaniment to these videos.